Welcome to the Dirt on the Past, the museum edition, a YouTube and podcast program of the Extreme History Project, which explores ancient and historical topics relating to artifact collections from the Museum of the Rockies right here in Bozeman, Montana. At Extreme History, we explore the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past because, let's face it, history isn't pretty, but it's so important to know because it's at the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney, and me, Crystal Alegria, as we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt, and in the archives, and in museum collections to uncover fascinating histories that are relevant to today's issues and can help us move forward with a deeper understanding of the past. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. And today we are recording both audio and video at the E.L. Wiegen Digital Learning Studio located in the Dinosaur Hall here at Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. So today we're going to discuss the significance of an archaeological site known as the Hagen Site. It's a 15th century, so we're talking about the 1400s here, indigenous settlement located near Glendive, Montana. So in the far easternmost portion of the state, just over the border um, from North and South Dakota. And a significant portion of the artifacts from the Hagen site are actually curated here at the Museum of the Rockies. And we're excited to be able to show you a few of those artifacts today. So this program marks the third of yes. the um, video podcasts that are part of our new collaboration with the Museum of the Rockies that we like to call the dirt on the past the museum edition and we're excited to be working with ashley hall who's working all the cameras and everything for us today and michael fox who's overseeing all of the artifacts for us um, and with that we'll get started with today's program yeah well, welcome everybody we are going to be talking today with nancy so i'm going to be doing some interviewing of nancy because nancy knows all there is to know well maybe not all but <laughs> Nancy knows way more than I do about okay, the Hagen site. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take, take that. that. I'll take that. It will work. Um, and this Hagen site is a really significant archaeological site. And if you took an Anthropology 101, you probably heard about this site. It is that significant. Um, it's really an important site, but we don't hear about it a lot. And so because of its importance, we want to talk about it today and because the Museum of the Rockies has these amazing artifacts from the site. So I, uh, and the reason that we're talking with Nancy today about this, because we were discussing, well, who should we bring in to interview? And I said, Nancy, you just wrote an article or a chapter in a book about this site. Well, it's, it encompasses yes. a lot of yes, other things, it but it does yeah. talk about the Hagen site. Yeah. And so I'm so excited to announce, and we've talked a little bit about this on this podcast before, but the New Deal Archaeology in the West book has just been published, and Nancy has a chapter in this book. It's chapter three. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to open it up here. And the title of Nancy's chapter is The Advocate, the Avocationalist, and the Academic, a story of three men and the unlikely success of New Deal archaeology in Montana. And so when Nancy was writing this chapter, we actually, I actually interviewed her um, probably a year or so ago about this chapter. So if you go back in our podcast, you'll find that podcast episode as well. And it's worth a listen because we talked a lot about pictograph cave we in that did. interview. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep. So, but if you want to pick up this book, new deal, new deal archaeology in the West edited by Kelly Poole and Mark Howe, that would be amazing. So it's a great book and the chapter by Nancy is spectacular. Oh yes. Very good. So. Yes. Thanks. so that's all site. little plug for the book. Yes. And a big shout out to Kelly Poole. She did an amazing job pulling all this together. And there's a Thank lot you. of wonderful chapters in there. Um, and it puts um, a lot of the Western archaeology that got New Deal funding in the 1930s on the map. So it's great. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So congratulations. Yay. Nancy. Yay. An official congratulations. Because hey. this is so much work. <laughs> I know I was with you as you were going through yes, it. Yes. So. A lot. Well yeah. worth it. So Nancy, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you came upon the Hagen site and why you took an interest in it. 
Yeah, um, I was interested when I first started teaching here back in ooh, the early 2000s that I knew the Museum of the Rockies had archaeological collections and I was interested in what they actually had here. And I was trying to also make myself smart about Montana archaeology because I had come from a tradition of working in the Southwest and I had two little kids and I knew I wasn't going to be going away to do those projects anymore. So I wanted to find something closer to home. And I also felt it was important to use museum collections, which sometimes get ignored and they don't require new field work, but they can still provide new data. A lot of the material hasn't been all analyzed and sometimes they could be revisited with new methods and technologies and things. So I came over and at the time, Pat Roth was the registrar here at the Museum of the Rockies. That was three registrars ago. <laughs> and um, she made a, a deal with me. She said, we do have some archaeology collections and if you would like to use them, um, we just need you to probably help us with cataloging them and doing something. So she introduced me to, and maybe Ashley, I'll have you spot put on the overhead for just a second. Is this upside down? Should I switch it around? Okay. Oh no, it's okay. All right. So this right here is a page out of the Kramer Lewis ledger. So Joseph Kramer donated a gigantic over 400 page handwritten ledger with a, a ton of photographs. Um, each one put in with these photograph corners and all of the artifacts pictured in the ledger, almost all of them he donated along here. And where he got all these was from his friend, Oscar Lewis, who was about 20 years his senior, but he had met in the 1950s around the Billings area. And Oscar Lewis was involved in the very first professional excavations in Montana. So Pat Roth introduces me to this ledger to then all of the hundreds of sites that are encompassed here. And these two men, Joseph Kramer and Oscar Lewis, who were, were pretty pivotal historically in early archaeology in Montana and the preservation, at least, of some of these artifacts, which he then always had told Oscar Lewis, if you can't do anything with them um, later in life, I am happy to organize them and donate them to a respected repository. And that's what he did. But no one had done much with this ledger when I came along in the 2000s. So the first thing Pat Roth had me do was scan all this in. And one of the places that had a lot of material associated with it in the ledger was the Hagen site. And that's when I started to realize that the Hagen site was one of these early first professionally, if you can call it that, <laughs> professional yeah. excavations yeah. in Montana in the 1930s that were funded by works project administration money, depression era funding. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's back up a little bit, Nancy, and um, talk a little bit about the Hagen site, where it's located. And then also, um, you kind of mentioned some of this, but when was it first investigated? And then also when it was first recorded? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, maybe we'll quickly throw up that first slide from the PowerPoint so people can get an idea. Um, there's the state of Montana, and you can see the big fat red arrow pointing to number nine, which is the Hagen site. And that's all the way over on the eastern side of the state. Right off the, the edge there is North Dakota and South Dakota that almost split the state. I don't know exactly where that border between yeah. North and South comes in. But it's right along the Yellowstone River. The Missouri is um, just north of it there. And the Yellowstone is flowing into the Missouri. And all of those, both those rivers are flowing east and eventually dump into the Mississippi. So that site is near Glendive, Montana. And over in that part of the state is where early on um, in the early 1930s, a man named Melville Sayer who was a teacher at the School of Mines in Butte, he got the archaeology bug in the 1930s because they started finding that people were in the Americas much longer than originally thought. They started finding Clovis points associated with extinct um, megafauna. And so they realized, oh boy, we've had people here way longer than we originally thought. And Melville Sayer 
was like, there's no archaeologists in Montana, and this is virgin territory. We don't know anything. And so he started going out and talking to farmers and ranchers, and that's how he came across some sites that happened to be located in the southeastern and eastern portion of the state, especially along the Yellowstone. So he was the first one to start talking to people out there. And then it was Oscar Lewis, a rancher who kind of had a really bad ranch, I would say. This probably is a he was in a real successful ranch. No, you know, he was a he was a cowboy for a yeah. while and a wolfer and he yeah. was making a living doing that. And then he homesteaded, he proved up, got married, married the daughter of sort of the owner of the ranch next door. And yet every time he was out looking for things um and and dealing with his cattle or on his ranch, he just was fascinated by the archaeology that he found. He was and an he, archaeologist at heart. He was, and yeah. he read everything he could, and, and he had gotten to know some people on the Sisseton Reservation, and he had a, an admiration for Native Americans and their way of life, and they're able to survive on the plains. He, he was kind of a, a hearty, rough and ready guy, and really admired what they were able yeah. to accomplish with without, you know, guns and horses before them. So anyway, he came across the site um, on a um, farm owned by Thomas Hagen. And originally the Hagen spelled their name H-A-G-A-N, but it got misrecorded early on. Oh, really? So yeah. anyway, Oscar Lewis went out with um, a young group of students, which was the first funding to take um, National Youth Administration Program money, take them out. And they found so much stuff on this portion of the Hagen farm that is um, along the banks of the Yellowstone. It's it's on the north bank and there's a severe drop off. It's estimated to be about 80 feet down mm -hmm. to the Yellowstone. And so who knows if some of the site was cut away, but the site was um, several acres and a lot of material. And when they started scratching the surface, they found um, some cash pits and then they noticed some mounding in different areas. And those turned out to be very significant portions of the site. Okay. All right. So can you talk a little bit about, so this site is a pre-contact site. Yes. Yes. 1400s. Yes. Pre-contact. It's a farming site. It's a farming site. Which is, is something we don't often find in Montana. No. So, so, and then Oscar Lewis comes across this site, starts um, investigating it, recording it, right. and then talk about one of your other characters that you discuss a lot, William Malloy, and yes. how he came into this into yes. the story. Here. So, um, so when Oscar Lewis first found the site and first investigated it with uh, the teams of students, Melville Sayer, who was the one going after the funding, yeah. eventually got more money and they went back to the site and they decided that they were going to be going to excavate uh, three important sites in Montana that they had funding for and that this site on the Hagen Ranch that became known as the Hagen site was going to be one of them. And part of the reason was, as you say, they suspected it was a farming village. So how would they know that yeah. from looking at it right off the bat? What Oscar Lewis found from his initial uh, excavations, exploratory excavations, was that there appeared to be an earth lodge. So there was one mound that was 16 feet across that was clearly constructed of clay and, and stone and had wood timber posts supporting a roof. So it was a an earth lodge, not unlike what, what you would see further east along the Missouri that the Mandan and the Hidatsa tribes would make, and some of which you still can see examples of today. Yeah, yeah. And so he had known about those. He knew that was probably an earth lodge. And then in these pits, he found a pumpkin seed. He also found hose so hose construction of bison scapula that had been shaped and then tied to sticks um and he found a lot of pottery and well constructed uh pottery that you don't usually find that much of unless you're at a sedentary site also a lot of grinding stones malls and um ads and other things that nomadic people don't carry so much heavy material around with them and things that the kinds of tools that you wouldn't make or use that often if you were um, a plains tribe that was focused on following bison and other game that's nomadic. So not only do we have a constructed house, at least one, yeah. but there are these storage pits where the Mandan and Hadatsa, just like that, they would, they would store corn and other food. And then you had all these implements that looked just like other 
farming village. They looked nothing like what you would find um, in a camp that had had teepees on it. Okay. Different material left right. behind. Right. Mm -hmm. So very different. So this is very much a sedentary village mm -hmm. um, in Montana. Right. Where as most of the sites in Montana um, really represent that nomadic culture, that nomadic plains yes. culture where people are moving from place to place, kind of on that seasonal round. Yes. Looking for bison in one area, looking for, you know, gathering other types of foods in different areas. Winter this, camps, summer camps. Yeah, this yep. is very, very different. And that was what I think probably Sayer and yes. Malloy and, and Lewis were very interested in and so. why they were... Right. So one of the re reasons they selected it. So Sayer gets the money. Oscar Lewis turns the the reins of that excavation over to a man named Wally Phelan, who is, starts excavating it because Oscar Lewis is called to pictograph in ghost caves to head that right, excavation, right, which was much right. bigger. Yeah. He was the foreman of. So they're over in Glendive. And um, at the end of two seasons, they've recovered over 30,000 fragments oh of gosh. pottery, over 10,000 um, animal bones, and a lot of remains of human burials. And these were somewhat fragmentary because they were included in a much larger burial mound that was a circular mound, 45 feet across and about five feet high and had different layers showing that it had been specifically constructed and that people were then interred into it, perhaps after they had already had um, a scaffold burial where some of their remains, oh, their bones were defleshed, and then there might have been um, a cremation and their bones and offerings were then placed in this mound. And it was in use what it looks like over um, many, many decades and artifacts were put in with the remains and the analysis of the remains that they collected was estimated to be at least 23, as many as 40 or more unique individuals. So we know if those are just the, the folks that in the small test excavations they did, they recovered, it was probably a pretty sizable population yeah. that stayed in this place and was buried in this place and, yeah. and farmed it. So, you know, that you can kind of think if you've ever gone through North Dakota and gone to the Flint River Village, I think is what it's called, and they have some really good dis descriptions of the villages there, and you can yeah. see the remains. Why don't we go the, to, yeah, yeah let's go to the next that? slide first, just, yep, okay. and that slide is showing just where the heart of the Mandan and the Hidatsa and Arikara would have been located along the Missouri River and its tributaries because those folks are downstream. They're in a slightly more temperate climate where they would have had warmer weather, more frost-free days, um, more rainfall, plenty of opportunity for irrigation. And you can see the star outside of that circle is where the Hagen site is. And so it's not tremendously far. There was probably always movement and interaction and trade, but really within that circle and within that square, within that is where you had the heart of these earth lodge villages. Mm -hmm. So if we go to the next slide, we can actually see a couple of photos. Um, yeah. And thanks for doing that, Ashley. So when you get to that, yeah, there we go. So this is an example yeah, of reconstruction. Nice of. Yes. Yep. And yep. we actually had painters coming out in the 1830s um, after Lewis and Clark who were, were painting what they saw. Right. So that's an example of a very dense, large Mandan village with all these earthen lodges, which tended to be bigger in diameter than the one that was recovered from the Hagen site. Okay. But in terms of layout, very similar Very similar so earthen so, and stone walls what it looks some like timber posts like a hearth yeah. inside um the structure was roofed you had a, a doorway entrance way um and in some of these sites you had sort of a central kind of plaza like area there and then usually a little bit away from the site you would have had um a burial uh mound or area so if we go to the next uh slide this gives you a sense that there's the village and out in the fields you see all those scaffolds those would have been where bodies would have been laid out so they would dry out um, they would get down to the bare bones and then those bones would have been collected by relatives and there would have been a secondary burial and ceremony and they would have been put into a mound in another ceremony. So probably we are seeing 
um, examples of that very same activity happening at that mound at the Hagen site. Okay. And this this site, the Hagen site, really isn't very far from from this location, from these locations. It it's is not close. that far. Yeah. It's just upstream. Yeah. People could yeah. have paddled there on yeah. the rivers and they probably did trade and interact often plains people providing bison hides meat you know in exchange for corn squash and other goods that the villagers were producing so there was probably also intermarriage between these tribes and, yeah. and things like that yeah okay all right so then we're talked about the investigations and the recording that happened in the 1930s so in the 1940s. So talk a little bit about right. what has happened since that time period with this archaeological Absolutely. site Absolutely. and the artifacts <laughs> right. that were removed um, at that time. Yeah. So yeah. the collections that we have here at the Museum of the Rockies are the ones that Oscar Lewis collected in 1936 and 1937 when he first found the site and he first excavated, um, I think, at least three um large pits and these pits could have been anywhere from three feet deep to six feet deep and then three feet across so, so that's what, a lot of volume of material Go and ahead. what were these pits what was in the, right. what was found inside traditionally these, pits? these same size and shape pits were found in mandan and hidatsa villages and they would have been often lined with clay and indeed the ones that at the Hagen site, you can still see some fingerprints where they would have smoothed the clay. Oh, wow. They probably would have lined them with grasses. And before we had these horrible rats that came over later with Europeans that could chew their way into those, mm. this was a very good way to protect and store your food. So they would actually put corn, put pumpkin, put all sorts of food stores in these pit. They could be protected from groups that might have tried to raid the village and it, and it just stores it, it just through the winter exactly yeah. so so that's what have been and then what happens later in time is as different households go through a life cycle and a pit might start to collapse then it becomes a place where people dump garbage their okay. refuse their trash so that's great for our gal yeah because yeah. we get broken stone tools broken pots which all have needles so much information all these other yeah. things that they use that we want to know about now what we don't know is when oscar lewis was excavating them there we don't know if those pot those those pits were filled all at one time mm -hmm. or if there would have been stratigraphy so there okay. wasn't there was a focus on collecting items that could be exhibited during the 30s um and and that might be useful not for controlling um the strata so that was 36 and 37 in 1938 and 39 when they excavated they also excavated the entire earth lodge some of the mound some more pits again they didn't really notice any stratigraphy so it was just a very large horizontal excavation um but those artifacts as i mentioned the thirty thousand pot shirts they bring back right to a lab mm -hmm. the funding falls apart because melville sayer who headed all this up his wheels kind of fell off. Okay. Yeah, he really <laughs> couldn't keep it together. That's another story. Another story. You can read it in the chapter two. Yeah, but yeah. um, but so there's a hiatus where there's nobody in charge. Okay. And then and then um where is this lab? Yeah. So the lab was originally in <laughs> Billings. And yeah. then Melville Sayer tried to move it to Lewistown yeah. uh because he had a girlfriend there. Um, after the divorce, <laughs> it's a pretty good. Story. And then the Lewistown <laughs> material comes back to Billings because a, a whole bunch of people who were initially supportive of, of this whole project went back to the federal government and said, OK, now we really want to hire somebody with training. That's where William Malloy comes in. Okay. So he's a young graduate student who already had been digging in the field. He had already dug on another um, works project administration project. And so he decided he would take this job and head up. Uh, these so he shows up. Hagen site has already been excavated, but he's got thousands of artifacts. So he sends off the the bone, the faunal remains from animals, and the human bone to be analyzed by other folks. And he decides to tackle the pottery. And in 1942, he publishes what he what was recovered from the site. And his analysis led him to talk to so many other archaeologists who had been working on these Mandan village and Hadatsa sites. And that's when they noticed a, a, a large portion of the pottery looked very similar to Mandan pottery. But then there was another chunk of the pottery that was decorated with different techniques. Mm. And so that's the first time it occurred to um, 
William Malloy to suggest that perhaps this was a split where the crow, everyone knew linguistically the crow and the Hadatsa had very similar uh, longstanding ties. And at this point, the it was floated that maybe this site marked the first foray of Hadatsa onto the plains where they may have tried to grow corn and then eventually stayed and took up a bison economy, maybe becoming what we now know as the crow. So ancestors of the crow could have settled the Hagen site. And that all came from understanding the relationship of the pottery, um, showing that it did indeed have connection to these Eastern sites, um, but that there was also something new. And so some other groups may have joined the the folks that came out from the Mandan and Hadatsa, um, and or they may have developed their own new styles. So okay. yeah. Okay. So yeah, after that, just to go on from there, yeah. after the 40s, not a lot of work was done until the 70s, okay. when people again started to get interested in, is this actually a site um, that could have represented the ancestors of the crow first fissioning off from the Hidatsa, mm -hmm. but there weren't any dates. So we know in archaeology, right, Crystal, that one of the most important things is like, how old is the site? Mm -hmm. How do we know how old the site is? Mm -hmm. And pottery in the Southwest is often a very good tool. The designs change very quickly. We have a um, centuries of information to use. It's not as easy to do that up here in Montana in this part. So what you really want is radiocarbon dates or something mm -hmm. to tell you when the site was occupied. Okay. All right. Okay. So then, so we're now up to the seventies, the 1970s. So then what happens after that? So in the 1970s, people are, archaeologists are talking to the crow and talking to each other. Yeah. And uh, Les Davis, uh, who was an archaeologist here uh, as curator at Museum of the Rockies and also teaching at um, uh, Montana State University. Oops. <laughs> and he gathered a, a bunch of folks together to all have a symposium and think about it. And so George Frizen and a other symposium folks. symposium about the Hagen site? Yeah, nice. and about that crow Hidatsa okay. sort of situation and yeah. when there could have been splitting off. So there was an effort to define, well, what is crow pottery? Can we identify what it looks like? And can that be a tool to identify ethnicity? Um, and what do the crows say about the site? And that's when it starts to come out that the crow have a name for the Hagen site that they reveal is the place where corn was planted but died and didn't grow. And we know the crow later, they have such strong roots in, in their um, oral traditions and their histories talking about moving around to find the sacred tobacco and that they had a split with the Hidatsa and they moved onto the plains and they do find it. We don't really think they could have been farming tobacco at the Hagen site. There's no, there's no evidence that we have anything yet of pollen or anything else that suggests that. Mm -hmm. So I don't think anyone's proposing that, but it seems that um, that story that the crow have also lined up well with Robert Lowy's linguistic studies. Mm -hmm. So he looked at the Hidatsa language and the Crow language and using a sort of historical linguistic technique, looked at how quickly certain words could be introduced and changed and they could fission off to have the differences that we see today. And he projected in the 1400s was when you would have had a splitting between those two groups that they were no longer residing together enough that the language would evolve together. It was evolving separately. Yeah. So the 1400s was thought to be um, maybe too old or maybe not old enough for the crow to develop their own bison economy, which they would have had to develop way before the horse. So they were figuring out how to hunt bison well, way before the horse. They had dogs. We find dog bones there too. Mm -hmm. um, so the 1970s was a discussion of all those things. And I think it got people very interested again in how can we find out really once and for all when this site dates to. Yeah. So it wasn't until Les Davis decided to go back to the site and people started to go back to the collections that were held now at University of Montana. And 
they took a rib bone from an animal that still had enough uh, collagen in it, and that was radiocarbon dated to the 1400s, somewhere between 1435 and about 1475, 1480. And that lined up well with at least one charcoal fragment that was radiocarbon dated to the 1400s as well. Another piece of charcoal was dated to 1210 AD. Mm. That could have been an old piece of wood. Yeah, It could have been from an earlier occupation. Mm. So far, the dates we have seem to cluster around the 1400s, which works really well with the linguistic evidence and also lines up with the pottery that looks like the Mandan pottery. That same style pottery is found out at well-dated Mandan sites also from the 1400s so we're feeling pretty secure that this is the time period Mm -hmm. yeah okay so that's in the 90s and then in the 2000s with les davis um oh boy crystal so (laughs) this is interesting because we don't actually know all the results of what les davis found he went into the field with some students yeah took a field project and they went out to the hagen site got permission from the landowners Which privately owned. Which, right, exactly. Still by the Hagen family. Still by family. the Hagen family, okay. but in the 70s, before we leave the 70s, yeah. that's when it was registered as a National Historic Landmark. Right, right. Yeah. So, so they, they used recognizing all it. the information yeah. from the WP excavations and Malloy's report, and they nominated it, and it was it was approved. Mm-hmm. So um, no, nothing else on the site had been disturbed, they report, mm-hmm. but they went out, and they couldn't see where the earlier excavations from the 1930s had happened now this is 70 years later in 2000 2000 the year 2000 the year 2000 les davis takes students and so they couldn't recreate where those excavations were because they wanted to match up notes and artifact locations couldn't do it so what they decided to do instead was to take a magnetometer and we've yeah. talked about magnetometers before on yeah. the show. And you've you've been on projects yeah. that have used them. Yep. Yep. So you're running across the site <laughs> kind of like a lawnmower, yeah. but it's it's shooting down, you know, magnetic information and and finding how much resistivity there is. And it'll tell you if there's anomalies under the ground that might mean there's either or architecture or a pit, disturbed yeah. soil, yeah. anything like that. So they were able to locate two more large pits that they did excavate. Mm-hmm. And Les Davis did. At Les this Davis time. did okay. at this time. Okay. Uh-huh. Now those materials, they did a surface collection too, and those things are right now here in the museum. Okay, there's a huge amount of material, and I, I, I think they've only barely been organized. Yeah. Um, some very large, um, stone, uh, items, uh, lots and lots of chips and flakes and things like that too, okay. all still present on the surface From in the 2000. Surface. Okay. And then the magnetometer, when they revealed the two pits, they excavated those. And I believe that those items are still being analyzed right now okay. by um, Jack Fisher, who's looking at the faunal remains. And I think probably other experts who are looking at the um, the projectile points, the types of materials, um, what sort of trade or interaction they might be able to glean from that information if there's obsidian perhaps they're sourcing that so les davis has since passed away and i believe a whole cohort of archaeologists is now trying to finish up the analysis yeah yeah okay all right well good well good well i say we dive in and look at some of these artifacts now that we talked about (laughs) the site and we talked about the um, some of the artifacts that have been found and when they were found and how they were excavated over these different time periods. And it'll be really interesting. Now, these artifacts are are artifacts that you don't often find in sites in Montana. Just We'll just say that. <laughs> some, some of them are and some of them aren't. Yeah, exactly. that's true. Some so, of them are yeah. some of them aren't. So before, before we put yeah. one of the artifacts up here, we're going to have um, Michael come over and, and bring things maybe one or two at a time. If we go back to the overhead cam again, um, I just want to point out this object right here, Crystal. Yeah. Um, that object is made of shell. Wow. Yeah. And it is, um, it has a perforation there. And initially they speculated that there might have been another one. Yeah. And that this may have been one half of a pair of snow goggles. Wow. Yeah. And if we go back quickly to the PowerPoint, just before we get to the artifacts, Mm -hmm. there's some examples of the pottery and we're going to see some of that 
pottery here. So this is so these are examples of Mandan pottery. So yeah, so some okay. of these techniques are what you would see with Mandan pottery. And so okay. the Mandan, they would take cords and impress it into the clay mm -hmm. to make designs, whereas other pottery found at Hagen, they would take cord and wrap it around a tool and press that. And it makes okay. different and and this was Malloy noted this way far back. People have verified this all the way through. And this this where they um really um carve into the clay this dentate pattern that's also mm -hmm. something you don't have among the mandan yeah. but the rainbow designs and those those cord impressions are mandan it's beautiful it is beautiful yeah. pottery and we have some good examples and then okay. if you just go one more slide that's to give oh, you a shape of, of the storage okay. pits and how they might have been lined and how you would be able to see them if you were excavating at a site and if we go one more these are some shells that are found at the Hagen site. So dentalium shells come all the way. So these artifacts are found at the Hagen site. Right. Okay. Well, not these specific ones. These okay. are examples, examples of what was found. Gotcha, so gotcha. that could have been a pair of snow okay. goggles. That's a replica. Yeah, that, that, right. you know. And then the dentalium yeah. shells are, they come from the Pacific coast. There's nowhere else to get them. So we know we find these at like Pictograph Cave, yeah. some other sites. These are things that would have been made into those beautiful um, yokes or capes or necklaces or all other kinds of jewelry. And so we, we do find that as well. So plenty of examples of bracelets and other ornamentation too. Okay. Okay. Now okay. let's look at the artifacts. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. So Michael's going to bring over something first. Um, Oh, he's going to bring the pottery first. This is great. Yeah. Okay, let's have a look. <laughs> All right. All right. Wow, here. look at that. I know. Isn't this amazing? That is it. That is amazing. That's beautiful. So this definitely has amazing yeah. impressions right here all along the rim um, of what would have been from the, the curve on this. This would have been a, a pretty large vessel with a pretty large open neck, but then you still would have had an even larger body and then the inside is all sooted as well as the outside. So yeah. there would have been a lot of cooking of yeah. probably a lot of stews that would have gone on in this pot. Mm -hmm. um, this one's super interesting. This reminds me of what I uh, would see a lot in the Southwest where you almost have coils here um, yeah. on top of each other to make uh, the rim and the neck of that piece that's been reconstructed. This would have been hammered um, with an anvil on the inside and a hammer on the outside okay. to get it thin and strong. Uh -huh. And we were talking earlier, Michael was asking, how do we know if these were made at Hagen or if they were traded oh, yeah. in from somewhere else yeah. and or brought from somewhere else? And I think eventually it would be wonderful. Now we can do these analysis where we can take a very tiny piece. We can compare it to pottery from Mandan Hidatsa areas and to local clays and then determine where, where the pottery is made. Where the clay came from. Yeah, where the clay came from. For the pot. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so we that could, one is really This one looks really yeah. um, a little bit different, um, yeah. the, the decoration of this along the rim. So we do have more than one style showing up. Um, and I think it would be a wonderful project for somebody to combine the stylistic analysis mm -hmm. with um, a chemical composition analysis, and then really understand maybe a little bit better, at least what sort of interaction, where these were made, who was trading with who, yeah. and what those two different styles might represent, what kind of relationships. Right. Because we know people were moving around on the margins of this area. This is an area where it would have been difficult to grow corn and so the folks that were here were probably transitioning from this agricultural way of life mm -hmm. into something more nomadic and bison centered. Right. This okay. one looks like it has a huge, yeah. Um, you know, yeah, the, the, the whole bowl of it, it, it would have yeah. been a gigantic yeah, pot. Exactly. And, and both of them, it looks like from the curve that they would have had a really huge diameter yeah. on the top. So these are very, very big. Large. And again, you wouldn't be carrying those large pots around if you were nomadic right. and moving around this and having really... dogs with travois carrying your stuff or carrying it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and these are also really well-made. They're really they're hard. Not... They're not nearly as friable. So but um, they're big fragments. You know, a lot of times you only find small fragments. But these are such, these are so large and they're so 
um, substantial that you, you know, can see the design, yeah. you can tell a lot more about them. And like you were saying, when you were digging at Ulm Pishkin, yeah. and that is a bison kill site. It's called close First, to Great People's, Falls. First, First People's, People's State Park now. That's yeah. right. Yep. First People's State Park. Yeah. What was and the pottery there? The, part the pottery there was really small, really um, fragmented. Like the, I don't think we had any pieces bigger than that. I mean, they were just really small. And they did have designs like like you could see some of designs like this, but it was just not the quality <laughs> that these are, you know, I mean, it was just, and, and it looked like dirt. It like these, there's color to them. And I don't know if that color is because they were in a, in a fire pit at some point or, or what, but the color is very different than the, the um, ceramics that we found at the um, so it could peoples. be, it could yeah. be the clay and it could yeah, be it could the be. firing method. Yeah. It, so there's definitely different things. And again, more questions to be answered. Right. So that right. would be great. Right. All right. Okay. So what much. else do you have for us, Michael? <laughs> no. I just wanted to tell folks too, if you are listening to this um, and listening to it, to it on our podcast on Spotify or iTunes or something like that, there is on all these museum editions, there is a video version on our YouTube site, which is, if you just Google um, Extreme History YouTube, you will get to this video version. So, okay. so if you want to see these artifacts and you're just listening, go to the video version on YouTube. Here comes Michael with the <laughs> bison scapula wow. that has been transformed to be used as a hoe. And these are apparently very common at sites in North and South Dakota that would have been along the Missouri River, all those Mandan Hadatsa sites. And so to find these at Hagen is again, one of those smoking guns that somebody was farming. Yeah. 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 And um and then the true smoking gun was that the uh analysis of soil samples that came out of one of the pits had corn pollen in it. Okay. So we do have pumpkin seeds, we have mm. pumpkin um pollen and we have corn pollen. Mm. So for sure um this Wash is corn. one of those yeah. amazing tools that would have been used. And that just shows they were planting gardens and using this to till the soil. And this was used yeah. even historically. We have lots of records of people um, seeing uh, these bison scapula hose. So this goes all the way back to the 1400s though, which yeah. is, which is, you know, I guess if something works, you know, yeah, don't why fix it, it if it's exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So what did, so you, you said they would tie some. They yeah. Would... So they would tie the end um, of this with cordage um, to a stick and then be able okay. to use this way to break okay. up the soil okay. absolutely they okay. would have had digging sticks too but yeah. the hose would have been really invaluable wow yeah that's spectacular i know right yeah it really is and that one is shellacked and numbered because <laughs> um joseph kramer in his efforts to organize oscar lewis's collections wanted to make sure everything was labeled now we don't shellac and write on things no we don't yeah do that anymore but in those days that's what they did <laughs> yeah all right so now we have some some small stuff here yeah and this i have found quite fascinating um at the hagen site because um do you know what these are crystal well i would say those are bird bones or they are Fish bones? These are fish bones. Okay. So we have some um, fish ribs and um, uh, and some other places, some vertebrae. And what's that? Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. Yes. And so in a lot of the pits, um, a lot of this came out. And so even Oscar Lewis, when he was excavating in the 1930s, um, probably using very basic screen, a quarter inch screen. And um, they were finding and noting that they were finding fish bone. And he was guessing sturgeon and catfish. Um, later analysis suggested that they also found um, trout and um, catfish for sure. And then there was one other, but so there's definitely fish being eaten. And I used to always hear the story that the crow wouldn't eat right, fish and, right. and don't like fish. Yeah. Um, but we find at sites where we believe there's crow occupation, we find fish bones at times. Yeah. And and you mentioned this earlier too, that maybe it was a starvation food or a food 
fish were a food they would eat yeah when needed historically they would they kind preferred. of call it horror food exactly horror food, and so yeah so i think yeah. that um at least traditionally the crow will talk about preferring um hunted game rather than fish and um in in terms of foods that they prefer but clearly there was fish now at the site 95% of the animal bones recovered were bison. Now bison have okay. a lot of bones in them. There's yeah. big bones and all of that, but um, amazing preservation that we have some fish bones. They yeah. also found fish hooks at the site. So they okay. know they were actually fishing with hooks. Wow. They may have also had nets and weirs that we, we don't necessarily have good nice. preservation of those. But the fact that we do have some bones at all suggests that they're really a diverse amount. So they find porcupine, they find their ungulates. And then um, they also found a lot of uh, bird bone, not a lot, but relatively speaking of the fish. So we have eagle and some other uh, birds that they may have hunted like turkey to eat and the eagle bones perhaps for feathers or something. Okay. Yeah. So there's some, ser there's these, these bones have ser yes. serrated edges. Why is that? Any ideas or thoughts? I don't have an idea yeah. on that for this one. I was noticing that yeah, when we were on, looking on at it on yeah. all of these. So and these ones must have been. Maybe not all of them, but this right. one and this one and this one. Right. And we'll have Maybe to. This one. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know um, if Kramer had any speculation on that. I'll look in the ledger okay. and yeah. we'll put an curious addendum note that. on there. I know. Right. Very right. curious. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, Michael. Super exciting to see these things out in the open. Yeah. I know. And so um, this is just, you know, a small portion of, of the collection that's here at the Museum of the Rockies that we're right. looking at today. So we just, so you came in and worked with the, um, the collections specialist, um, Melissa Dawn, to kind of pull just a few examples. Yes. And so there's much more, but we're just seeing a few examples today. And these are some really beautiful projectile points that also came from the Hagen site from 1936. Oh, yeah. Should we move we'll these down them, here? We'll put them a little bit closer okay. so we can see them better. There we go. Really beautiful side notched, um, very thin points. Um, that super tiny one almost looks like a what they would call a later bird point. Um, some of these are so thin and beautiful i would i would categorize them as an avonlea point which were um, used with a bow and arrow and we find them in lots of parts of montana we found them at the bison kill site that mike and i were excavating near yeah. judith gap mm -hmm. um very very much like this and um definitely a range of materials yeah, and lots of different some material of the material types. that comes from the site looks like it could be knife river flint mm -hmm. which um we find a lot of in again over the border in the dakotas so not sure where all the quarries are from these sources um i didn't see any obsidian in the collection we have here but mm -hmm. i've heard that the later excavation with les davis found some obsidian and perhaps we'll get some information on the source of that okay. quarry and some other quarries. Yeah. Okay. So definitely a lot of reliance on hunting, a lot of bison yeah. bone there. So the folks at this site were really practicing a very mixed economy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Those are beautiful. I think the symmetry on these always blows me away. Yeah. I always think, you know, who was the individual who figured out how to get it right without breaking them all the time. Yeah. And then you're always like, were these used or were these just left over? Mm -hmm. You know, did mm -hmm. they pull them out of an animal after? Oh, and speaking of pulling them out of an animal, That's the true. next That's artifact next. is going to be really fun to look at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This one is is really is really interesting. And you see this every once in a while, but yep. <laughs> yeah, but it's always exciting yeah. to kind of see it up close because we know that people were shooting arrows to bring down game. And here we have a bison bone. I think that you said, Ashley, you think this is a scapula, which it would have been massive on a bison. And right here we have the back end of a projectile point. Wonder. No, there. That's better. Yeah. yeah so maybe yeah, look we at can that. also, or maybe if I hold wow. it up this way, you can see the. Um, it's that same material. It looks a yeah. lot like Knife River Flint, 
and it's the back end of the point is broken off, but it's embedded in the stone. So okay. part of the pelvis. Yeah. Okay, okay, bison pelvis. She takes it back. She said, <laughs> "Okay, awesome. Yeah, fan. Yes. Yeah, so now you're getting a better look at the whole thing. Pretty, pretty fantastic. And that is really wedged in there. So, yeah. um, preliminary. But you can see the notch. You can totally that's see the so, notch on the so side amazing. of it. There, it's so, so amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. So cool. It can go right into bone. Wow. So it tells you how sharp these things I mean, are, and with how much force. That's way in. There. How much force? Yeah. I know that's yeah. going in. So, um, from what Jack Fisher has reported early out, is that it looks like a lot of the the bison material that ended up at the Hagen site, bison were killed somewhere fairly far away, they think, because it looks like just cuts were brought back. So okay. you don't get the, you don't get any of the heads or the johns were are not anywhere near a kill site. Huh. Um, so people were going out and hunting again, way before the horse. And so you have to lug back um, probably the, the Parts, prime portions, yeah. right? right? That you were, so they might've quartered it and then cut off pieces and maybe a whole group of people went out to help recover once yeah. they had made some kills. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got another. And then um, other bone transformed into a way to process bison hides, which would have also been stripped and brought back. And okay. so we have um, a fleshing tool here. And if Ashley can um, zoom in a bit more. So what kind of bone is this? Is this a bison bone, do you think? Any, any you are advice? asking somebody who's not a faunal expert. So there, Ashley. there ends my expertise. Ashley, <laughs> Ashley's the faunal expert. It's a really room. large <laughs> bone. So it has to be from a big animal. Yeah. I believe it's, it's either going to be deer or, or bison, elk. I Maybe would guess, elk. or elk. Although they no, don't no, really no, have a lot of elk bone. Yeah. No, we see elk tines from antlers, yeah. but not elk bones so much. So my guess is it's either deer or bison. Okay. And it is, it is really big. big. It's very thick and very big. I would say it's bigger than a deer for sure. Okay. okay. Well, let's go with bison then. And we'll get confirmation from someone like Jack yeah. Fisher. Yeah. So it's clearly been, been worked. And then you and see used. the beginnings. Yes. And on the edge. So yeah. they would have been stretching out hides and defleshing those hides. So then they could dry them and tan them, turn some of them into robes and, and others into skins um, to use for all sorts of things. Yeah. So that's one of the tools recovered from the Hagen site. That's Again, dating to cool. the 1400s. Yeah, yeah that's Thanks. neat. Okay. Yeah. Do we have anything else or is that it, mostly everything? Yeah. So oh, we have okay. some more stone yeah. tools to look at. So we'll All take right, a, a peek at those. Yeah. Don't ask too many hard questions okay, about them because I'm not a lithic <laughs> analyst. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sort of the generalist kind yeah. of archaeologist. I'm not um, specifically a stone tool expert. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have lots of knives. We've got blades. Beautiful. We've got, Beautiful. there's drills and other bifaces and things there. So we see yeah. them working. And again, I would love to know and have confirmation of all this type of uh, material. And is yeah. this local? How far were they going? Were they trading? But these yeah. knives are beautiful. You've got these great sharp edges. They would have been hafted yeah. into bone or antler or something to be used. Um, so a lot of cutting edge. This might have, I mean, this is, this looks like a, an exceedingly large That's dart point, but I am not sure yeah. exactly what that You're would have been. doesn't look like a drill. Thick experts no. here. <laughs> so I'm just going to leave that. I'm just gonna There's assume. apparently yeah. um, all over the site Lewis and others talks about finding these um, end scrapers and thumb scrapers. Okay. So tons yeah. and tons of stone tools, people processing there would have plants been. and hides yeah. and all sorts of things. So yeah. there's just so much. It looks like maybe they, they shellac these together at some point. This one anyway. That one's been yeah, um, kind of re reconstructed, put, reconstructed, put back together. Yeah. 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 So they, there was some work done on these, some, you know, during, you know, they were probably finding this close by each could other have been all both in the same together. pit yeah. exactly yeah. and then realize that it refit each yeah. other so and again um different types of material this almost looks like porcelainite and yep. then this looks like some kind of flint maybe knife river mm -hmm. so I'll be interested to learn a little bit more about um reconstructing how people were getting the materials they needed whether they were going out to quarries themselves who they yeah. were training with so lots more that we could figure out from this site with future work is that uh, all of it Michael. Okay. Wow. All right. Thank wonderful. you so much. That was very exciting. I mean, I think that 
I wish we had the snow goggles. That's the only I thing I wish we I had. Know. I'm not sure that's what that is, but it's just so fun to think about. I know it looks like it, but who knows? I know exactly. But you know, these, these artifacts are so interesting to see. Um, and that pottery is just phenomenal. The pottery was yeah. phenomenal. I think that um, there's a lot more work that could be done. And I'm really interested to know if in the 2000 excavations, they also recovered large pieces and large fragments like that, that more yeah, can be done with yeah. so yeah so there's so many um phd dissertations master's theses that students could work with these collections either here at the museum of the rockies or or at the university of montana to better understand this collection will have has so much information in it that is still to be gleaned and learned so that's one thing and that's one reason we're showing some of these artifacts too yeah. not just so that they can be shown but also because there's so much still to be done with them there's so much research that can still be done and the museum better needs help in cataloging yeah. these and getting them into a database so that yeah. they can be used more and this is just the the Kramer Lewis portion of the collections, we still have many, many more uh, large amounts of things coming from the Davis 2000 excavations, and some of it's here and more will be coming. So there's definitely volunteer work to be done and then yeah. actual research to be done. So right. it's exciting. Yeah. So, so what are some of those um, questions that as you've been working with this collection and others have been working with this collection that are still being asked that would be interesting to find answers to? I think as we were talking about this and talking beforehand, I think if we could get a few more radiocarbon dates to solidify whether we have one period of long occupation in the 1400s or if we have something longer or two different, would be a wonderful question yeah. to ask. Yeah. I think, I think if we could know more from the, be some test excavations as to how many other earth lodges there may have been. For a while, folks were disturbed, thinking that there was only one, and yet so much material, and evidence of so many people buried there, that they thought, well, maybe there was one or two earth lodges and the rest of the people lived in teepees. Mm -hmm. But I think the more recent research is suggesting perhaps there are a lot more earth lodges. They were just difficult yeah. to see in subsequent visits. Um, so I think figuring out a little bit more about the, the structure and size of the village and understanding yeah. how many people were there. So how long the site, the site is occupied, how, how many people might have been living there at a particular time. And then I think to understand a little bit more about who settled this site in this area, which looks so different mm -hmm. from any contemporary sites around it or so many other sites in Montana. And if it is this critically interesting period when we may have had groups starting to fission off from um, the Hidatsa and the Mandan and, and become another nomadic group that we know today as the Crow. I think knowing more about the pottery, I think trying to do some chemical analyses of the pottery and the clays and trying to reconstruct perhaps where the pottery was made, if it was exchanged, if it was made locally, can give us a better handle on understanding movements of, of people. And then same by same token, also comparing that then to where the stone to raw material is coming from, we could get a much better handle on what we can say about if these people came from this part of the lower Missouri River or if um, we have people who came in from Canada or from other parts of Montana. So not that it was Montana at the time. No. <laughs> so, but the Yellowstone um, yeah. sort of area. So I think those are main questions that could be answered yeah. with um, some of the data that we have or a little bit of collection of new data. Yeah. 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 Well, it's such an important site. And I know Les Davis was really... Um, um, interested in this site. And so his, his legacy will go on as well Oscar Lewis's as people start to 
um, learn more about the site and do more research on the place. Um, and really no more digging probably has to take place because there's so much that has been excavated already. So years and years of research could just be done on what is in museum collections currently. So Right. I think yeah. a lot of the, the questions we just mentioned, Les was probably interested in answering and, and yeah. hopefully some of that material when it's fully analyzed will give us some more answers. Yeah. 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 So yeah. maybe we'll do some updates on this site as time goes on. But um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Nancy, mm -hmm. for for uh, letting us pick your brain today about the Hagen site. And Ashley, thanks so much for your work in um, funnel identification today. And, <laughs> and as well as all the camera equipment. Yeah. I know, and technology, yes. <laughs> and thanks so much to all our listeners out there for joining us today. Uh, if you love this podcast, please tell a friend, pass it on, and um, please leave us a review on Spotify or iTunes if you can. That would be wonderful. A five-star review always helps. It always makes our day. And then if you want to, if you're listening to this and you want to see it, um, so you can see these artifacts and see the slides that Nancy put together, um, just go Google Extreme History YouTube, and you'll see all these museum museum editions there. So thanks for listening today, and we hope you can join us again to find out more about the, the dirt, dirt on the past. past. Okay, and a big thank you to the Museum of the Rockies for, again, the use of this amazing uh, studio space. Thanks to Michael Fox and Melissa Dawn at MOR for allowing us to bring those artifacts out to show you. Also to our editors, Drake Pinnell and Sierra Thomas. Thanks also to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music and to Steve Durbin at KGVM and John Chadwell for getting this podcast out into the world. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.